Okay, folks, yeah, there's still a couple of people coming, but I think we'll, in the interest of time, we'll get started. Um, welcome uh, to the Library Mistakes. Um, today we have a, a great, great pleasure to, to welcome Tian Yang from uh, Varian Perception, uh, the CEO and head of research. Um, as I mentioned in my um, introductory email, um, these days it's so, so hard to figure out what goes on in the world and Unfortunately, the vast majority of people who opine on things um, have a sort of a, a set of beliefs and that's what they translate. If they find data that supports it, great. If data doesn't support it, they just discard it. Uh, and what, what uh, I always found incredibly helpful and uh, valuable about Tian's work uh, is that his organization is incredibly agnostic and data-driven, so if the data says X is true, well, that's that's what they believe. If X is no longer true, that's what they believe, um, which is which is very helpful because quite often intuitive uh, things aren't true and counterintuitive intuitive things are true. And uh, actually, and that's the most valuable because um, with the passage of time and age, we, uh, we've become very set in our ways and <laughs> believe a certain set of things and and don't change, uh, even when we should. Um, anyway, so it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Tian, and he will give us an overview of how they analyze the world, how their models approach things, and and maybe some some um, high level views on on where he thinks um, the world is going, key asset classes and whatnot. So I, I hope you find it helpful, um, Tian. Yeah, awesome. Please. Well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming and you know taking time out of your your personal time in the day to come. So, um, you know, I'm gonna try my best to add some value here. Um, the nature of these one-off talks is that, you know, I think I would prefer to focus more on some of the maybe mental models and, you know, food for thought, kind of structural things you can take away rather than necessarily, you know, narrowing on one view. Um, the analogy I always give is treat this almost like, you know, this is a cookbook. Like you have your own way of cooking, you have your own recipes already. You're not gonna, you know, put it in the oven at 200 degrees exactly like I am. But maybe there's an ingredient here that's interesting for you, or you might be allergic to something we're doing, you know, and you can discount it. So that's kind of the uh, how I've thought about the presentation and how how we're gonna try and then, uh, and do this today. So, oh. ah, okay, great. So. So I think to start with, I would like to lay out a few kind of concepts uh, that are very critical to how we um, approach the world. And um, in general, I would say it's maybe a little bit different to, uh, you know, if you're a value investor and, and you've gone that way or you're just a macro trader, maybe um, it's, it's less intuitive. So the high level idea is that man plus machine beats man or machine alone. So we want to essentially use the latest in data science to try and make the things that are repeatable, repeatable, give that to the machine. And then once the machine spits out some output, then the man part comes in, we have to sanity check if it makes sense. And so to do that, it's really about sitting in the sweet spot between data science and essentially a qualitative understanding of history. And obviously we hear, you know, we hear the library mistakes surrounded by all these books. So Think of it this as the machine tells you where on the bookshelf to go look, essentially, and then you read the book. Um, so just to give you a feel, one example of how this would work in practice is uh, an algorithm that's quite popular in signal processing is called dynamic time warp. Right? So it's the algorithm they use uh, in speech recognition, for example. So if I say the word apple with my you know, specific accent, someone else says apple with an American accent, how does Siri know we both said the word apple? Well, the dynamic time warp algorithm takes essentially the two sound waves and does a sequencing match. And it understands, ah, actually, these waves are evolving in the same way. Right? If you want to sound fancy, the fractals sound, look the same or the shapes look the same. Now, this obviously has applications to finance because we're used to going on our Bloomberg terminals or whatever and plotting charts, but we're limited by the fact your x-axis is always a fixed unit of time no matter how you stretch, right? So you can see how using something like this, it gives you an ability to kind of match price patterns to history a bit more reliably. So now you start matching price patterns for you know, equities and bonds, 
and you know, maybe FX, uh, what's, what is inflation doing, what is GDP doing, and then when you notice there's a cluster of dates historically where all the price action matches, then you know, okay, maybe I should do some digging around you know, that particular time period. And, it, and often it'll turn out that, get, that gives you a much better kind of historical perspective on what today looks like. So going back to this, you know, today things seem unprecedented because it's been a long time since we've seen inflation, COVID might seem new, fiscal stimulus, but it turns out today is very similar to 1969, 70 and the lead up to the recession. And I've got a slide a bit later where we can dig into it. But essentially these are some of the concepts we're trying to apply and sort of what we mean by data science plus qualitative history. Uh, the second key point is to focus on the right data. So I think 90% of the battle is won in choosing what data to use. And then after that, the methodologies don't, you know, they might matter the margin, but it's really about picking the data. Most of what you see in the news, we will consider useless. So GDP, useless, right? All the things, non-farm payrolls, job data, useless. All the data series that make the news headlines, if you audit how they perform historically, what you find is that the first release of the data is what matters in real time, not, the, not what you see on your Bloomberg terminal. When you type all these data series or you go to the IMF or whatever and download the data series, these data, you know, say for 2001 or 2008, it's been revised multiple times. In fact, even now, 20 years later, data series from 2001 are still being adjusted. Right, there's always adjustments. Sometimes it's because you know, uh, we gotta tweak our model for some demographic factor. Oh, there's something we gotta shift. Now, I don't think it's malicious, but we have to understand most economic data was not built to help you make money in real time in, in, in markets, right? They're built to understand longer term trends, help policymakers, right? Understand, you know, do like count, uh, urban planning and so forth. So, you know, this is, this is very, very important. So one of the most egregious example would be GDP or non-farm payrolls, right? Where, again, w basically if you were to be a cynic and you look at the data, essentially at turning points heading into a recession, the data will always look good. And then about a year later, when it's obvious it's a recession, they go and revise it back down so that it looks like it's a recession. And then later on, they realize they did it too far and, and it gets revised back up, right? And so you can empirically observe this. Now, this isn't easy to do unless you've obviously got the first release of the data, but by having this process, you understand what to focus on, right? So, and it turns out things you can focus on that's not heavily revised are uh, often surveys because, you know, they give you a kind of a marginal shift. Uh, stuff like money supply tends to be less revised. Building permits are less revised. A lot of it is about spending time on the methodology in which data is created. So if the data comes straight out of the government computer system, where there's some actual utility, it's linked to something that people care about, it's going to be more accurate. So for example, continuing jobless claims, initial jobless claims, right? people again pay their benefits, right? state governments need to track this closely. So when that data comes out, there's not a big problem. But your headline unemployment rate, that's based on a survey where they ask a subset of households and there's about you know, all these assumptions about what is the correct demographic, how do we change the sampling size. Oh, and by the way, you know, the labor force is 150 million people, and we're here in the markets talking about 50K you know, deviation in the monthly non-farm payroll, and then we rally 2% or sell off 2%. Right? So this is um, a big part of the battle. Um, the second part is to understand that the magnitude in which data relate to each other is not going to be constant over time. So, you know, in, in maths, when we do a lot of proofs, you have to start with axioms, right? What is a fundamental truth that you can assume is true? And then you derive things on, the on top of that. And at least in our journey in finance, what we found is so many things are not axiomatically true, but they're approximately true. And so in macro land, you know, when people do GDP models and all these things, right? Like, like they're approximately right, but you can't rely on it. The only thing we found is reliable is sequencing. There's a fixed sequence in which data evolve over time. And this is the idea that there's data that's leading, there's data that's coincident, there's data that's lagging. Intuitive examples are, for example, building permits are necessarily a leading indicator of construction activity, right, by definition. And then construction activity are necessarily a leading indicator of 
say, uh, consumer confidence or white goods demand, because only after they build a house do people buy. So there's a lot of these relationships. You know, famous examples are kind of the inventory cycle in manufacturing and so forth. So again, a lot of time what we want to do is focus in on leading data that does not have a data revision problem, only use that to train models, and then suddenly things make, make sense through the noise, right? This is, so you know, like, like today is a very good example where data keeps surprising on the upside, on the downside. This, you know, today everyone's like, oh, maybe this is stagflation, maybe it's not. But if you look at things through the lens of what's leading, coincident, and lagging, often a very clear picture emerges. So inflation is a very lagging indicator. Right? Inflation should be high right now. Retail sales, uh, industrial production, these are more coincident indicators. So just at the turning point, they should be starting to slow down. And obviously, you, you've been observing this in retail sales in the US, for example. But you know, building permits are leading. Right? The housing market data has been horrific for a while. You know, manufacturing is leading. You know, ISM new orders has been horrific for a while. So once you apply this leading coincident lagging framework to the macro data, only at that point does the top down make more sense. And only at that point can you actually use it for context for essentially more specific investing. Because ultimately, we have to translate it into security or stock. And, you know, to stop that being noised, you know, this is kind of what we think is important. Um, and linked to that is this concept of observe and infer versus forecasting. So, you know, Yogi Berra's famous quote is that, you know, it's, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, right? So, you know, my, our solution is don't try and predict the future. Just follow leading indicators. Observe and infer. I'm just going to sit and wait and wait for my leading indicators to move, have a turning point, and then once I see the turning point, I then see, okay, amongst the four uh, investable universe of asset securities, where is this most discounted and least discounted? That's where I look for the opportunity. I, I don't, it's too hard to try and predict and forecast where the next GDP thing is going to be. Right? I'm relying on the, on the sequencing to work and then use that to kind of help focus in on areas to spend time in or where you want to prioritize uh, risk budget allocation. Uh, the last few concepts, so proxima versus fundamental. So again, this goes back to the idea of what is fundamentally true versus approximately true. So you know, a great example is say you know, I try and balance you know, this presentation on my finger and it, you know, it falls off, right? and, you, and you can ask, you know, why did it fall off? And a lot of the excuses might be, hey, the air condition is on, or you, you know, you know, somebody walked by, right? but those are what you, you would say proxima causes. Right, they're, they're not fundamental. The fundamental cause is that it's, it's unstable to start with. Right, you shouldn't be balancing it on your finger. So a lot of times in in our analysis, we need to think long and hard about what is a fundamental driver versus what is a proximate driver. Right, and a lot of times the narrative and the focus tends to zone in on the proximate catalyst. So you know, recent bank runs are a good example. Right, the the proximate cause is clearly uh, SVB's business model. Right, or first Republic's business model, you know, maybe there's issues with whether you insure the deposits or not, right? And obviously, you know, in the case of SVB, you know, they shouldn't have you know, locked up all these things at a very low duration, right? That, that's the proximal cause. Yes, it's a problem, people zeroing on their risk management, but fundamentally, the capital cycle for the entire US banking system had changed for a long time, for a while, right? There was like a too much competition to start with in the US banking sector, which drove more risk-taking behavior, right? So at the same time, Inherently, the business model of banks is, by definition, a duration mismatch. So, once, so the fact that the yield curves inverted 18 to 24 months ago told you that system-wide, the system was going to break anyway, on top of the competitive dynamics. Now, this doesn't tell you it's going to be SVB that might have broken, although obviously there's a lot of famous investors who caught it. But this will be an example where the fundamental setup is the capital cycle understanding of, of the basically the, the credit system, the, the inherent mis duration mismatch of the business model, and then the proxima would be whatever catalyst happened to you know, cause you know, SVB to you know, go to zero, right? Um, and then finally, it's the idea of doing top-down and bottom-up. So in finance, you know, we all have to specialize by definition, because the only way you get good at something is if you specialize, and then people obviously pay you for that. The, the problem is obviously we end up in our silos, and it's very hard then within our silos to see you know, other inputs or to have, the, to have enough knowledge to judge what is BS and what isn't. Right? So a bottom-up guy, Goldman's GDP forecast might be great. I have no idea if it's great or not. But you know, if they haven't put the work in, they might not be able to judge if it's good. 
And so for us, a lot of what we do is we try and build models um, that combine top down, bottom up to give clarity. So we, we're tracking about 400 different global region industries built bottom up using single stock data to understand capital flows, competitive dynamics, and so forth. And that's what offers context to a lot of the traditional top down lead indicator stuff. Right, so yeah, we can, so obviously we have a building permit release data we can focus on, but you can also track the capital cycle for US home builders. And if there was a line, they'll generally give you a better idea uh, of what's going on. So those are some, some of the kind of key um, ideas. Um, now, do I, I would say no individual piece is so hard to replicate that, you know, given, given you have, you know, reasonable budget, reasonable time, you can do it. I think the power, though, is to try and take everything and combine it. You know, a very good career advice I was given before was this idea, you know, you can either be the best at something or you can be unique. And I decided a long time ago I wasn't going to be the best at anything. It's very hard to be LeBron James. But, you know, it, it turns out that if I can just be maybe 80, percent, but just of everything, but eventually I'll have a very unique mix where, you know, we, we have trading models, right, that can trade on a one month horizon and generate alpha, but then we have macro models, so I can have some macro context. We have stock picking models, so I can at least have some view on sectors, and, and you know, we have structural models, demographic models, you know, we read history, so maybe at that point, by having a unique mix, it can also be um, valuable and complement, you know, all our clients who are the best at whatever field they're doing. So. Uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's kind of um, the core framework. And so this is going to obviously drive some of the, uh, uh, the views and, and things that can come up a bit later on. This is, this is quite a fiddly mouse here. Oh, OK. Um, right, so now, now that we've got the kind of framework out of the way, I do think there's a few key things to also define, um, starting with time horizons. So, my, our, our impression is that most of the time in finance and investing, disag disagreements are generally linked to time horizons rather than someone saying something stupid. It's more people are not explicit on the time horizon. They expect things to happen, and that's why they disagree. So if we're going to do any kind of discussion, it's important to clarify what long-term, short-term, et cetera, mean to different people. So to us, generally, tactical is one to three months. Over that kind of horizon, it's all about trading signals, proxying for flows, positioning, understanding where position is most uh, extreme. The cyclical to us means six to 12 months, and this is where it's about lead indicators of growth and liquidity, mainly in kind of US, Europe, China, which probably account for 60 to 70% of the kind of drivers, and then you have kind of 30% local. That, that'll be roughly the split. And then structural to us would mean two to three years. And so here, you know, there's going to increasingly be more art to things the longer the time horizon goes out. But at least empirically, what we found works is, you know, you can essentially quantify capital cycles, which will um, help flag kind of sectors and areas of outperformance on the two to three year plus horizon. So that's reasonably reliable. Uh, demographic models are reliable once you include the quality of institutions. So, you know, um, you know, AC Moglu got very famous for, for you know, won a Nobel Prize for a lot of his work on institutions. So what we found is that you don't want just sweet spot demographics. Um, what you also need is proxies for institutions. So stuff like female education, female employment, internet penetration, a lot of these things tell you when a country's in a sweet spot. And when you interact it with demographics, that's when it's meaningful. Um, so that says, um, so, you know, these are some of the ways that at least you can try and also have data drive a long-term view, but obviously it gets increasingly harder. And so ultimately for us, we let the data take us to certain areas, and then we ultimately it's kind of a lot of still manual work to come up with these structural themes. So right now our big structural theme is this idea of age of scarcity, that you know, we've gone from a decade of cheap financing, cheap labor, and cheap commodities to a decade of the, the, the opposite, essentially. More expensive commodities, more expensive financing, and more expensive labor. And obviously, there's implications. You know, previously there's things like the capex. Uh, there's previously we did things like um, commodity super cycle in 2020. But the starting point is always that the models led you to certain sectors that were capital starved for a long time, and then we can dig into and see if it's going to reverse. So even for the age of scarcity, the, the motivating factor was a lot of capital models pointed you to the fact that infrastructure investment was very very capital scarce. But we're at the inflection point where the, the marginal returns to infrastructure are picking up. So this obviously ties into like a CapEx super cycle that I know, uh, obviously Russell Napier, you know, the 
you know, of, of, yeah, of, of a library of mistakes fame these days now. Uh, but yeah, so obviously that's one of his big themes. So that you know, that's how we would use data to also kind of see why he thinks it's true and how we get there. So, so first of all, time horizon very important. Uh, yeah. So okay. So I've co talked about the data. So you know, concept of the leading, constant lagging. Right. The third concept that's very important is idea of regime regime shifts versus kind of more continuous models. Because again, in our mental models of the world, we're used to thinking about things in a smooth, kind of cyclical way, right? Anyone, anytime anyone thinks of macro or economics, in your head you imagine like a quadrant kind of thing, right? The economy speeds up, slows down, goes into recession, recovers. You know, you, everyone puts like a chart up saying, you know, the US is here, China is here. This is true, we think, 80% of the time. Most of the time, the world works in a continuous way. So your regression models, these things are fine. But there's 20% of the time when the world is a, goes into a jump process, which is a regime shift. And tangibly, what that means is when you essentially have a deleveraging cycle or some kind of positive feedback loop that happens between hard and soft data that once it starts, becomes very hard to stop. Now, numerous people have used different uh, words to describe this, right? This will be, for example, how I interpret what Soros means when he talks about reflexivity, right? There's all these ideas, when do positive feedback loops kick in? So the way we address it is we say, ex ante, before it's occurred, it's very hard to predict. But what you should be doing is you should be very sensitive to the first sign that the feedback loops have started. So in practice, what we do is we have stress indices for purely soft data. So soft data is surveys, uh, market data, right? So credit spreads, all these you know, yield curves, all these things people track for soft data. And you have a stress index for hard data. So you know, it could be stuff we talked about already, initial claims, building permits. And the key is, if they both stress at the same time, just a little bit, but together, that's what triggers your regime shift model, right? There's no magic threshold at which something has to get to before you know, it's stressed. It's about the fact that deteriorating together, that's kind of, in our mind, the secret sauce. Um, you know, if, it's, if you're waiting for unemployment to hit like 6% to call a recession, you know, at that point, you know, it's probably almost over, and you know, markets certainly probably would have bottomed already. So the idea is that you want to catch when unemployment's going from, say, three to three and a half, you know, as an example, right? But the key is it's doing that at the same time as you know, bank shares are underperforming. It's doing that at the same time as high yield credit spreads are widening, and that, that's kind of the trigger. Now, obviously, unemployment is a, is a bad series, so I'm just giving that example, but let's say you know, initial claims, right? So you, know, you care when initial claims gone from 200K to 250, right? If you're gonna wait for four initial claims to hit 350K, it might be a bit late that it's, you know, it's already somewhat obvious it's a recession. So that, that's kind of how we think about it. You want to be updating this daily, and then that's when it triggers, essentially. And obviously, we'll see an example of it uh, in the coming slides. Uh, the last few things to define. Um, so obviously, I talked about capital cycle already. But essentially, it's this ultimate about competition. When there's too much competition in a particular industry, it will destroy future profitability. Just like when there's a lack of competition in an industry, future profitability has a chance to go up. So we essentially try to quantify this uh, using basically balance sheet metrics, aggregated bottom up. So again, very intuitive. What is a industry-wide capex you know, on the trading three-year basis relative to asset base? You know, what's industry-wide depreciation amortization? Um, and then the kind of key thing is you need a, a essentially return on invested capital component and you want to track the marginal ROIC. That's the piece that helps you avoid value traps and keeps you in secular winners. Because the problem with a pure capex uh, capital cycle approach is um, you know, for sunset industries, right? Say, you know, newspapers, whatever, you know, these things. Obviously, when they are in secular decline, the, the asset base is too big. It's going to be shrinking all the time. There's going to be no new investment into it. But the marginal returns are still terrible because, obviously, the, the actual final demand is low. Equally, for something like semiconductors, where even though money has been flowing into it for years, the marginal returns are extremely good um, over time. So it'll, it'll help to keep you in something like semis and keep you out of... Um, newspapers. But essentially, it's a way to quantify the capital cycle, where you want to look for industries where recent capex and R&D spend has been very, very low, the asset base has been allowed to depreciate, yet you have the first sign, the marginal operating return, don't invest the capital, is inflecting higher. Because it shows you the demand-supply mismatch is gaining traction, that it's starting to resolve. And then, typically, you'll get like up to a three-year uh, persistence. 
in uh, the kind of revenue and earnings turnaround potential. Uh, liquidity, again, very, very important concept, and you know, everyone defines it differently. Um, for us, you know, we, are, we think, again, the consensus of what you hear in the news is generally incomplete when people talk about uh, liquidity. So, you know, the, the, I'm sure you've all seen, right, people love to plot the charts of like central bank balance sheets, right? Maybe it's G4, central bank balance sheets plotted against the S&P over the last 10 years. And everyone's like, whoa, look how high the correlation is. Clearly, central banks explain, uh, you know, equities going up, which is obviously very intuitive. But you've got to bear in mind, if you take a, a level, a, a non-stationary series, and correlate it to a, something else that's non-stationary, you're always going to get crazy high R squares, right? So you can literally take any two lines that are trending higher. If you try and run the regression on the level, then clearly it's going to look really good. But the key is, if, if you look at the rate of change, does it match up? And then once you do that, the correlations start going to zero, right? And, and then, so I'm not saying central banks have not had a role, because clearly they have, but it's incomplete. Because ultimately, liquidity is about both the public sector and the private sector. How much money is being created from thin air by both that isn't being used up by the real economy and therefore is excess and supports asset prices? So intuitive, you, think, you, you can think of, a bit, uh, think of it a bit like this, right? So at the peak of the cycle, say go back to the end of 2021, nominal GDP is through the roof. But central banks, especially outside the US, have been tightening for a while, so global money supply was already slowing. Right, so you have a situation where money supply is slowing at the same time that the need for money from GDP growth is very, very high. So there's basically no excess liquidity for asset prices. So asset prices are going to start you know, being challenged. And, and obviously right now the headwinds are still there. Equally at the bottom of the cycle, when nominal GDP is negative, right, the real economy has no need for money created, but central banks would have been easing for a while. Right? And once that easing finally gets traction, money growth picks up. And so you take positive money growth, take away a negative nominal growth number, then excess liquidity through the roof, and that's like, and at the bottom of the cycle you want to buy on the back excess liquidity. And so that, this is one of the few concepts we found that empirically leads asset prices and is st uh, statistically meaningful. So the key is to, for us anyways, to think about it as we live in a fiat money system, all money is basically created from thin air, both commercial banks, central banks, and economic agents have a part to play. Um, but you need to focus on what we would say is high-powered money. So a lot of definitions of money are too broad, right? Everyone looks at M2, you know, everyone looks at loan growth, you know, debt to GDP. But the problem is by the time you've seen those data series go up, the activity or the price action linked to it would have happened already. It's only really narrow money, you can think of it as M M1, that's actually more likely to be predictive because M1 is essentially currency plus zero interest rate demand deposits, essentially. So you're only going to hold on to a lot of currency and have a lot of money in your demand a deposit account because there's being a, you, you want to do something, you need to finance cash flows because your business is growing, because you know, that, there's things that are happening or going to happen. Right? Once all the activity is finished, you'll be like, okay, I have no money for my money, so I'm going to save it. I'm going to park it in a one year plus savings account, give me a high interest rate. Well, now it becomes M2 because the savings deposit, right? It's not a demand deposit anymore. So just the fact that it's gone up just tells you people are saving more, but it's not necessarily the case that that's the future activity is better. So, so I think on liquidity, there's a lot of, you know, people out there talking about, you know, tr trying to correlate every kind of, every change in S&P to the fact that the central and balance sheets will move, right? And I think it's, it's a bit spurious, uh, the correlation, and not theoretically uh, true either. Um, so the key is to understand how much basic M1 is being created from thin air globally any one time, how much is it not being used by the real economy, and therefore it's kind of left over. Um, and then the final concept is to go back a little bit on this idea of playing the game. So on the one hand, we'll have an idea of what will happen. Right? The capital cycle, I think, is fundamentally true. Leading, coincident, lagging, I think is fundamentally true. They tell you kind of what will happen. The problem is, not only do you have that, you need to be able to play the game and be like, is this discounted into markets or not? And so here, um, I think we put a lot of time into understanding how to extract measures of crowding and positioning from the market. Um, you know, we, ultimately, finance is an imitation game. Markets get more efficient over time. or model efficacy will decay over time. So you kind of constantly have to be iterating to improve the models and also have 
a good team of humans to constantly update the models. But as soon as information becomes widely available, easy to process, the assumption has to be it's probably not um, particularly um, useful anymore, right? So obviously we've gone for a decade where just a, a, a very simple value factor performance not been great because if you just do long short PEs, um, right, where everybody can go on that terminal and get and get all the PE stocks, it, it's obviously that you know there might be a reason why it's not doing so well, right? Just like everyone can go and open up your app and get technical analysis now, right? So like, is that going to be value left in it if um, if everyone has it? So I think a lot of our focus is on focusing on indicators where there's a high barrier to entry in terms of processing power or in terms of data availability. And that, and the, then the hope is you have a few years of edge before it decays away. So I think philosophically that's like an a, a important uh, a concept in, term, in terms of the, uh, how to play the game. Okay, so now we're on to a, some actual views after all that, all that setup. Um, so age of scarcity. Um, so this, so I'm going to start with the kind of biggest picture and, and then draw in. So I think this is really forming the, the foundation of our, our thinking for the next three to five years. This, a lot of it actually overlaps with kind of Russell Napier, so I'm not going to spend too long because I, you know, I assume, you know, if you're, if you're here, you, 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 you probably uh, know, know quite a lot about Russell. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Russell and uh, actually I visited the, the Edinburgh branch of this library of mistakes back when it first started, when it was in like a little building. So yeah, it's you know, obviously a fantastic idea. Um, so I, I would say that the way we would characterize it is that, you know, you know, politicization of credit, uh, government crowding out, these are all, you know, I think themes that Russell's cover very well. What I would add on top, though, is that we're doing this at a time when uh, capital scarcity is still very real for uh, most of the important commodities. So there's been a quite minimal supply side response for obviously energy, for a lot of kind of critical materials like copper. So, you know, we know ultimately there's going to be quite persistent demand for these things and there's not enough supply and not enough incentive to grow. So the, the, the challenge is that you've got the politicization of credit happening at the same time as a, a kind of capital constraint within energy. So ultimately what this translates to is a period of kind of structurally higher inflation. Uh, but the other thing to note is that the kind of what's the right word here, the, the silver bullet in a way that will solve our problems today, that will solve stagnation is this idea of productivity growth. And I think this is where there's a misunderstanding of how productivity growth works. Because, you know, obviously technology innovation is very real. There's obviously lots of great companies. Um, and, you know, they've driven big changes in how we work, how we live our lives, you know, over the past 20 years. But if you take a long history, what you'll find is typically the total factor productivity or measure of productivity tend to go up periods when real oil prices are low. So it's only when your um, energy costs are very, very low that's actually an enabler of innovation. Right, so um, one of the big proponents of this is Steve King, who's kind of a, considers himself a maverick kind of post-Keynesian economist. And he has a fantastic quote on this, where he says, um, you, know, uh, you know, capital without energy is just a statue, right? Just like labor, without energy is just a corpse. So ultimately, energy is actually the foundational piece that we've all got used to the sheer abundance of in the past 20 years. That's actually the layer below what you see in terms of capital and labor that's produced all this productivity innovation. So this is one of the big challenges that's coming, in our view, for the next um, uh, decade, essentially, because we ultimately, if you view things as in terms of going from scarcity to abundance, in terms of capital cycle, commodity, and, Basically, most, most of the commodities we need, there's not enough productive capacity. We know that demographics, and in particular, skill mismatches means that in terms of quality of labor, there's also a labor skill mismatch. So you have increasing scarcity of labor, increasing scarcity of commodities. So that, in turn, actually means you might not get the productivity growth you need, which means that we're in a structurally kind of less efficient, uh, more inflationary uh, environment. And obviously, as a result of that, it will necessitate higher equilibrium level of interest rates, you know, call it 4% on average for US 10 year. Um, and obviously that means cheap financing is also, um, you know, we don't, we don't have the cheap financing of, of the last decade. So this is kind of one of the big um, themes. In terms of the, the, the practical investability of it, you know, I know Russell's pushing gold a lot, so I'm gonna say that obviously gold makes sense. But one of the big plays we like for this is this uh, infrastructure spending gap as well. So actually one of the, the things that's going to sit at the epicenter of this is that ultimately government's going to respond to this 
by trying to create a bunch of jobs doing infrastructure-led fiscal spending. We think this is probably going to be the solution they come up with in response to this, where the private market is not going to be willing to do this, but there will come a pressure for governments to essentially um, create jobs and to address um, all the kind of challenges people have. And so, you know, globally, there's already a big infrastructure infrastructure spending gap. Anyway, uh, you know, every time I come to Switzerland, I marvel at the trains running on time. How easy to get to places, right? You know, obviously, if you travel in the U.S., you know how terrible infrastructure is and you know it's like that and, you know I, you know I'm based in London every week there's a strike you know the tubes of you know the underground's broken so there's a, a big mismatch but there's been no um, there's been no desire to kind of fill this gap because there's not been enough political support for um, for governments to spend the money and obviously this has started to change in the recent kind of uh, one to two years right with the inflation reduction act in the US you know a lot of these themes of politicization of credit in terms of the rhetoric around investing in green energy and so forth right we would see it all in the context of the government knows they need to do something they need to spend money but the government's trying to square a circle where they need to address the energy shortage and also there's a desire for people to and create a bunch of like uh, jobs for people as well so you know we think this is one area that um, is capital scarce that's actually somewhere aligned to, uh, with these concepts that you're, you're going to be less subject to issues of crowding out politicization of credit um, and, and so forth um, otherwise, you know, it's definitely very much still a real asset kind of view, but obviously this is kind of a five to ten year uh, view, right? So, you know, upstream, upstream commodities, uh, gold. Um, for real estate, potentially uh, home building and some of these pass-through businesses could actually do quite well on the back of this um, construct uh, potentially construction booms and so forth. Um, the other thing to note is that obviously there are increasing geopolitical tensions in terms of structurally. So one of the big themes will probably be the bifurcation of commodity markets. So we've been used to 20 years of a global market, global price for everything. But you know, a, a very good example today is if China tries to buy their oil from Russia, because why wouldn't they? It makes sense. Then you know, chi China's going to be buying Russian oil for a while before they start having an impact on Brent, right? Because all the people trading in the Brent market is a separate set of supply, supply and demand. Right, just like you know, all the people that can access the Russian oil, that's a separate, right? It's the Chinese, it's the Indians. So you're probably going to increasingly get more bifurcated, localized commodity prices. That's going to actually uh, be a lot more important in determining kind of regional allocations for a lot of industries that are traditionally thought of as, as, uh, as global. So I think it's, um, yeah, if you want to be fancy, you can say the you know, balkanization, right? If you want to you know, get, get famous with this kind of thing, that would be uh, one of the themes. So, in short, this is kind of the idea, right? Cheap reverse of cheap credit, cheap energy, cheap labor. So this is an overarching theme that would then impose kind of the cyclical and tactical on top of. Um, yeah, so capital cycle, obviously, we talked about um, a bit already. But like I say, I think this is one of the most consistent sources of alpha we've been able to find. On a market neutral basis, you can generate about both, both theoretically and our sample, right? If you add it together, it's about 6% of alpha a year in terms of long shorts. Very, very persistent. Um, and I think the reason this works over time is that it works so slowly that, you know, in terms of the, the quarter to quarter, it might not have as much impact. So the, the, re the way we can get this over time is essentially every quarter you create a vintage and you hold it for three years. So that's how you end up with a very low turnover portfolio long shorts. And actually over time, it tends to spit out a lot of outperformance. Uh, so live today, stuff it likes is basically marine that basically tankers. Uh, com you know, energy, uh, home builders, food, tobacco, telco. So these are what's considered kind of capital scarce and areas that structurally we are, you know, that, that's kind of our main hit list for um, areas we look for longs. In terms of shorts, you know, obviously <coughs> banks, biotech, you know, f fairly intuitive, right? Software, autos, entertainment. So these have been, and these have been the, sh the, the target hit list for shorts for a while. You know, this, these things change very slowly. So it's been like this for about two years already, but you know, but in terms of structurally as well, on the forward-looking basis, this is still kind of where we are. Uh, so that, that gives you kind of a sense of how to then translate the capital cycle into something specific. And obviously, within this, we'll be going through it and looking at it going, okay, stuff like you know, tankers, shipping makes a ton of sense, energy, right? It's also tied into, these are also going to be necessary uh, tied into our age of scarcity thesis and themes. So you know, that would be particularly things we like. Um, and equally for things like banks, they generally aren't going to do well in the inflationary environment. Uh, uh, anyway, because it's generally nominal assets, and because of um, 
the fact that we're going to have a higher equilibrium level inflation, there's going to be issues around financial repressions and so forth. So the shape of the curve is going to probably be quite messed up. So there's a lot of structural reasons as well to be worried about banks. Um, now, obviously, I, I appreciate right after you know the bank runs, you know they, they sold off a lot. But just in terms of conceptually, the capital cycle is telling you that there has been too much competition in banks over the past essentially five years. That too many banks have needed to show PNL. So there's been tons of aggressive practices or things that's ha likely happened already. So we're going to a period where that needs to kind of wash out. You'll need to see an NPL cycle. You need to see kind of sector shrinkage. Um, on top of this structural thesis. So that's kind of why overall we would say structurally banks uh, don't, don't look great. Um, stuff like entertainment is obviously very obvious, right? This is like the streaming wars, right? You know, you know, Netflix was supposed to hit steady state. It was supposed to be profitable. But, you know, if Disney, everyone keeps trying to spend money and win share, obviously there's just too much competition, too much money is going here. It's going to take a while to rationalize. And so, so you know, that's why it's a short. Um, yeah, and biotech and you know, software and some of these areas. Obviously, there's high quality companies within it, uh, you know, one, but obviously there's a long tail of companies that have survived on kind of low financing, you know, VC, fun, VC funding that's allowed, that's kind of propped up the whole ecosystem. So again, if we're going to an environment where ultimately financing is going to be more scarce for these companies, then with the lag, we're going to see a flow through, right? So, you know, if all the startups could raise like 100 million uh, say, right, they're not so quite, but call it like raise five to ten million, a hundred million valuation. They go out, they spend on digital ads, right? That's obviously propping up, you know, digital ad spend. You know, they're going out and renting office space, right? They're propping it up. This is kind of the famous, um, you know, when Buffett and Munger talked about their lessons from kind of the dot com crash. They were invested in like a furniture leasing company at the time, which they thought was kind of, you know, obviously bulletproof to a tech bus, but it turns out obviously it's all the tech companies who has free money who was renting or the leasing all the furniture. And so th I think there's a lot of these kind of uh, uh, things that, that are now coming out uh, during this cycle, and that's kind of the implication uh, here. So biotech is capital abundant mainly because obviously after COVID, tons of money went into it, but it's not clear who's going to be the winner. Um, and autos is basically because Tesla, <laughs> that's it, <laughs> because, you know, t Tesla has spent a lot of money, the market cap's gone up a lot, sucked a lot of people into here, and now obviously every, every company is rolling out their, um, their electric cars, and obviously the Chinese are coming, you know, BYD, these are like very high, you know, neo high quality cars, and obviously, you know, every few weeks now we get, you know, a Tesla price cut right in the news, so, you know, th this will be kind of the, 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 you know, this is because it's been building up over the past few years. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the se structural sector implications. And yeah, just to give you a sense of the intuition, uh, so you know, obviously because uh, marine is essentially our number one ranked sector for, for the past two years in terms of the global 400 odd we can track. So, um, but yeah, you can see this is kind of the perfect example where the, the gray line here is um, basically CapEx spend. The, 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 I mean, it looks red on the screen, but I guess, yeah. So and this is essentially depreciation, and then you have the, the red line down here is the, margin, is the ROIC effectively. So essentially what you want to see is, uh, in, you know, back in 14, uh, you know, very famous, you know, legendary investors, Howard Marks, a lot of people went into shipping, right, and, and, and it didn't end up working out too well. It's because, you know, at times like those, what you had was you had CapEx starting to come off a lot, depreciation picking up. This is the, what you would say is capital scarcity, but you have not enough of a response here in the actual industry-wide return on invested capital, right? Whereas obviously by the time you get to 2020, these inflect, so obviously you get the first signal here, but then you get the really big signal here because you know, you've had at this point decades of the CapEx spend going down, the, asset, the, de the depreciation of the asset base has been going up, but now you get an actual genuine um, ROIC response, which shows you the demand supply mismatches has happened. Right, and obviously th these data update quarter to quarter, and most of the time it does nothing, but then there'll be one quarter, right, basically Q2, Q3, 2020, suddenly like, right, and then suddenly you've got to pay attention and, and it rises to the top. So this is kind of how we're defining uh, capital scarcity. So obviously for banks it's different accounting, so we're using loan loss provisions uh, to assets as, as a proxy. We, we try lots of different things for banks, you know, revenue to assets, revenue to risk weight to assets, a lot of these intuitive things. But it turns out the closest analogy is uh, loan loss provisions for, for banks at to, in terms of the capex uh, similarity. And obviously similarly for insurers, again, we have to ignore the investment income, 
But for insurance, we're just looking at basically the quality of uh, underwriting, right? So what is the total premium? They've, they've uh, gone from policy versus the losses, and, and that's kind of the proxy. So you know, in general, this can be applied uh, across the board. <coughs> okay, so now we can go to the cyclical. So the cyclical picture today is in uh, a period of transition. Uh, but right now, the liquidity lead indicator is still very bad. So the left-hand chart here is what I talked about before with uh, global excess liquidity, right? And generally, the way all our charts work is that the red is usually the leading indicator, so it's pushed forward by about a year on the chart already. So the red line is usually a guidance on where we think the black line is going to go. Um, so, so obviously, on these charts, you can kind of see, right, at the end of 21, the red lines would have been coming off a lot, but asset prices had to move. And then since then, the red lines just kept going down, saying the liquidity, overall excess liquidity picture is still very bad, but they're starting to bottom. So we're stuck in that awkward phase right now where ultimately we are still risk off, uh, but you know, we appreciate that you know, a lot of the, the, the positioning market adjustments have happened a lot already, right? Like the consensus position is quite bearish already. But so right now we're in that transition where we probably don't want to bet the farm uh, shorting max short all the time, right? We need to probably do it in a slightly smarter way. Uh, but the overall mass is still very negative. But from here, if truly we're going to go into recession um, and then the Fed starts cutting rates, then obviously these things will start moving back up quite quickly. And usually you want to see a few months of this to get real, real conviction that is truly the bottom. So this is like a slightly more safety first approach. And this is currently what makes us skeptical that the, you know, the, the equity bottom is truly in. Um, but obviously, I'll get to that a little bit later as well. Um, yeah, that's probably the main things I want to say on this slide. Yeah, so, going, so now going to the growth uh, picture. So as I say, we, had a, we have a regime shift model and a kind of more standard business cycle regression model. So from a cycle point of view, everybody knows growth is slowing across the board. So for US, Europe, China, it's all bad. But if you look at the regime model, you get a bit more of a faster reaction and intuition. So right now, on our models, we think uh, basically, in April, the China recession probability dropped to zero from basically almost 100. And we think Europe and US are actually still in recession right now. So we're kind of extremely out of consensus on saying that the US uh, recession has likely started already. And we think that when the MBER come to date this US recession, they will date the beginning to probably January of this year. Now, the reason I say that is... Again, firstly, due to data revisions, right? Most of the time, recessions are declared, you know, after the fact, much, much later, once they've revised all the data. But also, the beginning of a recession is typically defined as the peak in activity. Um, it's not defined as, you know, it's not defined as the teeth, right? When everybody knows it's a recession. So right at the beginning of the recession, there should be a ton of debate about whether it's hard or soft landing. There should be a ton of confusion on if which data looks good, which data looks bad, volatility in the data. Uh, but you know, based on what we consider to be unrevised leading data, uh, you know, the setup today looks very much like a, um, what it would look like into a recession. And, going, and here, the middle chart gives you that an intu intuition for that hard versus soft data stress I talked about, where you can see that the model also did a pretty good job during the 2010s of not flagging false recession positives, because during the 2010s, during the kind of major recession scares in 2011, 2012, those double dips uh, in 2016, uh, 18, what you generally saw was either it was hard data that was stressed, but markets were relaxed, or it was markets freaking out, but the hard data was never stressed. And so it's only really now, and obviously 2020, where both are stressed at the same time. So this, so you know, a lot of the pushback and a lot of skepticism, which I think is valid, is you know, generally in macro, there's so few kind of. Um, events that you can study, right? So how can you have confidence in a lot of these models? There's only been like, you know, you know, have, you know, especially for China, Europe, where you can get data, right? It's only been, say, been three major recessions since 2000. How can you have confidence? Well, one thing is your model should also not have false positives. So I would say that gives you a bit more confidence in terms of behavior. And then the second thing is obviously we've done some work digging into the behavior. And again, the secret source is that it's about the deterioration from the peak or the trough rather than some magic threshold level, which is, I think, where things might, might go a little bit wrong. Um, you know, my perception of why a lot of sell side economists and people are still saying, you know, soft landing or the economy is doing good is, I think one, we're focused on different things. So there's this narrative usually that, you know, the consumers, you know, two thirds of GDP. So how can you have a recession when the you know, consumer data, coincident data looks good? The first thing I would say is we've got to bear in mind that, 
even if the consumer doesn't technically go into recession, you can still have a major risk-off reaction. So 2001 was basically the first US recession in history where retail sales held up. And in fact, year-on-year -year real GDP never even went negative in 2001, right? But obviously we had all the kind of asset price correction cycles, all the kind of deleveraging cycles. So there's like a misinterpretation, I would say, in terms of wanting to be correct on uh, training their models to make sure you're correct on GDP, but actually it might not actually be as correlated to asset prices um, in the end, you know, as, as, as we think. The other thing is, if, if, I, if my incentive was to correctly predict GDP, and that's how I'm judged, because Bloomberg takes my survey and ranks me every month, then what I should be doing is building a regression model where I'm correct on average and minimize my error either side. Right, but by definition of building that regression model, you're going to be less sensitive at the turning point. By definition, because you're trying to be right on average. Right, you're trying to be right for that entire trending bit where markets don't care what the GDP releases. Right, and your trade-off is at the turn, you're going to be a little bit late. So this is also why I think we are very conscious in having this regime shift, focus on leading data, just to give you like a slight jump uh, in the methodology. So again, I don't think it's it's that they're doing something wrong in terms of what their incentives are. I just think the incentives are different um, for, for trying to predict a recession and, and even defining what recession is. Um, so we don't say recession is negative GDP, right? We say recession is we've trained it on the historical MBR dates, both the beginning and the end, uh, but we interpret it as you need hard and soft data at the same time because that's a bad regime where I don't really want to have a lot of risk on because the tail risks are too big. Right, and obviously we're starting to see a little bit more and more, right? Arguably the bank run is one kind of tail risk um, uh, that, you know, that you tend to see in these environments. Um, you know, we've had the, uh, the commercial real estate funds, right? Uh, putting up gates, right? You've seen Swedish housing, you know, there's a ton of bad data, right? You're starting to see some pockets of stress that you, is more what you would tend to see when there's hard soft data stress at the same time. Uh, so yeah, so overall this is kind of how, where we are. The interesting thing today is Again, being data-driven is we were very skeptical on the China-US uh, divergence trade at the beginning of the year because the data didn't say it was there. Whereas now that, the mark now that everyone's selling their Chinese assets, it actually looks like it's coming through in the model. So the China recession probability just went to zero. So we actually seeing a, so we actually see evidence that you know, China's gonna have a kind of a slightly better growth output whilst the US slows down. So obviously that starts, start, starts to favor um, kind of the, uh, China expose assets a little bit fr from here, and um, you know, so so that's kind of a marginal new, uh, uh, a new data point. So so basically, in summary, liquidity bad, not quite ready to turn. Uh, you know, U.S. and Europe, most likely U.S. you know set to go into recession. We think recession started, but China recovering. This is obviously a, quite a, a difficult setup because it's not fully aligned. Now going back to the sixty nine seventy analogy, I think this is ultimately I think what we are kind of hang on to a lot for guidance on what to do here. So if we look at, um, if you want to do like a, you know, play a bingo, bingo, bingo card of, you know, what today looks like versus, or, or rather a bingo card of what you, is unique about today, I think 6970 ticks all of it, essentially, right? COVID is basically, COVID stimulus is basically great society Vietnam War. Massive spending for a few years, which helped to drive demand-led inflation. Right. You, you also have the Fed flip into inflation fighting mode from previously not. You have collapsing lead indicators, um, high inflation, right? not obvious, you know, starting to roll over, but obviously not, not a target. You have the equity drawdown ahead of the recession. You have the massive inverted yield curve, but the huge surge in yields. You have the very tight labor markets. I would say all the things people characterize today as, as we've never seen this combination before. We've seen it before here. And so, uh, and obviously I've, I've, drawn, I've put up some of the analogy charts. The key one I would point your attention to is kind of the bottom left, which is that typically if inflation is not at target, the Fed is unlikely to act preemptively to stave off kind of the coming market stress. That's the main lesson from 6970. So if you look, the black line here is essentially what the Fed funds was doing. And obviously the, the red line is um, S&P, the drawdown going into it. So basically for the first few months of the recession, the Fed just holds rates and doesn't cut, even though normally the expectation would be that, you know, hey, look, initial claims are rising, unemployment is rising, the Fed should be cutting now, but it takes them a while to cut. And obviously they don't cut 
because inflation was high, right? They need to make sure that the data can justify them cutting politically. So you would need the hard data to be quite bad before the Fed can cut. And I think this is really important for today because a lot of the analysis I've seen where everyone says, you know, as soon as the Fed goes on hold or the Fed cuts, it'll be bullish. A lot of that analysis is based on the past 20 years, right? Everyone's taken basically the past 20 years when inflation hasn't mattered, right? Plotted the, you know, do, do, do the fancy time slices of equities at the cut and obviously it goes up. But I think this is what, what is missing. We are still in a, going into an inflationary recession, at least at the beginning. So uh, basically what you can see is ultimately the, the cut ends up being very bearish because even back then they cut too early so they had to hike again. And it's that hike that basically completely destroys confidence and you get the final collapse, right? And the Fed's made this mistake twice in its history. One is this, right, 6970. The second one was Volcker himself. Right, so Volcker came into the Fed in 1979, started hiking rates, and then the beginning of 1980, it was obviously going to be a recession, so he cut. And then very quickly had to hike even more because inflation was under control. I happen to think that there's probably a huge amount of institutional memory of the Fed where no matter what, they don't want to have to cut and then hike again. Right, that's kind of the overwhelming thing for credibility because in terms of the theory of central banking, it's basically timing consistent. So the reason central bank credibility is so important is if you assume central banks are credible, they can do whatever they want. If you assume it's not credible, no matter what they do, it's actually not credible. Right, that's basically the, the, the thing you can't square. So for the Fed and Volcker's hard-won credibility, I happen to think that they're going to err on the side of waiting until it's obvious there's a recession to cut just to make sure they don't have to hike again quickly. So they're gonna to have to allow inflation, these things to really come off before they can cut. So that's why I think ultimately this time around, when the Fed does move, it'll probably be quite bearish because it'll be so obvious that it's a recession that they cut. And so this is why ultimately we're still somewhat more cautious. You know, we have a slightly more tilt towards owning duration, owning gold, but then within equities, we're avoiding large cap US, we're more allocated towards some of those capital scarce. Um, uh, areas obviously I mentioned earlier. But th this is kind of, I think, a big concern where, again, most of the data doesn't go back this far, so people, so that's why a lot of the models probably are gonna pick up on it, but th this seems like a very close um, analogy to today and the key worry. And the other implications, if you look at yields, is actually yields broadly stay high throughout the recession, right? You don't get the typical benefit you would expect in a massive bond rally that we've again seen for the past 20 years in the recession. Because again, inflation is still somewhat elevated. You do get a slight uh, bull steepening of the curve. So the good news is if you put a bull steepener on, it's basically, or rather a steepener on, it should really make money in, in all the scenarios, right? But obviously the carry is not great right now, but um, you know, assuming you, know, you put it on a, a good time, it should still work. But the real, the real juice comes afterwards. It's only after the recession the yields come off because you need like extended period of the recession for it to become very, for the, the disinflation to actually come out. So, so that this is kind of, I think, just a very important thing to bear in mind when just you know, uh, processing all the data or processing kind of the news and the, and the things coming in right now. Okay, so now we can go a bit more specific on equities and bonds. Uh, so I think a very simple way we've tried to showcase this is in this checklist uh, approach. So we've just highlighted a few kind of fairly easy to observe um, events that you tend to see at market bottoms. And usually the more you see, the more likely is that a market bottom. And the key thing I would say about it is that, and the key thing I will draw your attention to is basically the, the top line, right? There's never been a market bottom if it's a major one without Fed easing, right? Because even intuitively, if you think about it, if it's truly like a major bottom, typically what happens is there has to be something bad that's happened to force the Fed to ease. But if the Fed's easing, it typically won't work immediately because the hard and soft data feedback loop started. So they have to ease for a while and to, before animal spirits can turn, because, before the self-reinforcing deleveraging cycle can be over. So at least historically, this is kind of how it's, how it's played out, and that's the, basically the concern for today. Now, the bullish arguments today are that, you know, we've been trained by the Fed to know they're gonna come to the rescue all the time. You don't want to own bonds coming out of this recession, therefore you're just gonna look through and hold on to your equities. Right. I think this is probably okay for now, assuming it's a very mild recession. But if we're correct, and it's gonna be a hard soft data feedback loop, and the Fed's actually gonna hold off uh, before they actually um, cut, then ultimately that could be a lot for selling. Right? It could, ultimately it might not be your choice uh, to hold on to it because you know, redemptions might come into the, right? because you know, say some other part of people's portfolio blows up. Right? Say they mark all that VC stuff down, 
even more, right? Or whatever, and something else happens, and then they suddenly have to start selling, right? These are probably the, those are the kind of dynamics we're talking about. That's the risk today. Um, now, the very interesting thing is we've rarely seen such a big divergence in um, intra-regional, intra-sector behavior in markets. So the bottom left-hand chart here shows what the, um, what the distribution of forward P looks like for single stocks for different regions. So the right-hand chart here is basically international stocks. And so this shape essentially tells you there's actually a big fat left tail of companies trading on low single-digit PEs already with the international stocks, right? And it's already very comparable to the 2009 and 2020 market bottoms. So typically, actually, at our market bottom, you see a lot of cheap stocks trading on single-digit PEs, forward PE multiples. And by the way, this chart is the same for small caps. It's the same for EM. It basically looks like that for everything other than US large caps. Right, the US large caps is what you see on the, on the left. Right, you can see there's a lot less of a fat tail on the left. There's obviously more expensive companies. It doesn't quite look like a bottom from a PE point of view. So first of all, there's already, a, so clearly in terms of what markets are discounting, um, there's already a big gap in terms of large cap US versus everyone else. So this will be a sign that it's important to do relative value. Uh, to us, right, or at least structurally to think about it, right? You, maybe you don't want to pull the trigger immediately because we'll get to that on the tactical, but at least cyclically, you know, this is kind of what we're thinking about, right? We want to take advantage of all the kind of, so when, during the US rallies, they're all opportunities to sell, de-risk, large cap US, take those off, go short those, and then return during the sell-offs when we want to buy, we want to start accumulating <coughs> uh, in kind of these kind of areas. Um, but obviously, all I've shown you here is the forward PEs. Right, they've all been revised down because you know people are not, not stupid, right? Everyone knows there's a slowdown coming. But what is missing today is there's been a minimal revisions in terms of the sales estimates. So all these PEs have come off because people think costs are going higher, so margins are being revised lower. But if it's truly going to be recession, sales will get hit. So you'll get a uh, kind of the, the operating leverage impact to the business, which is the other leg in earnings that to go down. That isn't being priced right now. So obviously there's a bit of divergence by sector. Certain area sectors have seen both sales and earnings come off, right? Like home builders being a good example, for example. So it's not quite uniform, but the, this is kind of where we are. So that's why this also ties in quite nicely to that 6970 analogy where clearly we're nowhere near the peak, right? We've had a bear market for a year. A lot of things have been discounted. So where are we towards the end? And so when I look at these things, I can be like, okay, we're probably like more than halfway, but ideally we want to see the sales estimates start coming off. The sales estimates are only going to come off once the macro data says the economy is bad. And then from there, if the macro economy is bad, the Fed's going to ease. And I have a much higher conviction to you know, max risk buy it next two years. right? So before we get there, we're kind of still in this awkward, awkward period right? where there'll be signs of stress in the market, but overall it doesn't quite feel right. This, this gives you a sense of why today's environment is quite difficult. Um, so this is um, the discount to NAV for all large uh, closed-end funds in the US. Right? So typically, I would think of this as a real-time measure of, of uh, risk appetite in the market. So, um, so you can see the discount to NAV is actually very, very large today, right? at minus 15%. Right? This is comparable to a lot of the major bottoms today. Right? So normally, these will be contrarian signs. Right? But again, because you know, the various other things I talked about, I'm, I'm not quite, all this is telling you is, yeah, if you can close your eyes, you're not going to get stopped out and you have companies you like, you want to hold it for five years, it's probably okay that you know, we're, we're 50, 60% of the way through the, the kind of bear market thing. But what, what else this tells you is, obviously you can get hit and it can go, it can go even lower. All this is really telling you is for the marketing aggregate, you know, going back to that liquidity concept is there's probably not enough net liquidity, enough risk-taking appetite to close a lot of these gaps. So we're not quite there. And normally what closes it is the monetary uh, Fed easing. So overall it feels like, yes, there's lots of relative value areas that look interesting, but in aggregate it feels like we're not quite there and it probably pays to wait a little bit. Uh, on fixed income, um, the big concern um, is kind of this right-hand chart here. So COVID has caused a huge amount of distortion to the data um, that I don't think the, the consensus market is that aware of. So shelter CPI has been consistently surprising on the upside for basically you know, the, the past 12 months, right? So everyone's wondering, oh, why is that the case? Because you know, US mortgage rates went to 7%. You know, clearly housing is in a recession, so why is shelter CPI so strong? Don't worry, it's gonna come off next month. 
and then obviously you, you rinse and repeat the next ones. Um, this is because of the distortions. So COVID has this massive distortions to data collection, and a lot of the methodologies for data collection was not built with COVID in mind, obviously. So how does shelter CPI get collected? Every month, they, the, the Fed will send people out, they will survey renters in one-sixth of markets. Okay, so it takes six months to even theoretically uh, ask all the markets. But in turn, what the question they ask is problematic because they ask, what is your rent right now? Right, so typically people will sign a lease for a year. So if you catch them at the wrong point in time, even though the asking rent in the market is up 20%, they may be on the rent they had last month. Right, so the data collection has a huge inherent lag in it, right, up to 18 odd months. Now, this doesn't matter when moves are small, which it was before. So you can see here that, the, what I've got on the bottom right-hand chart is that the shelter CPI, the observed rents, and the asking rents obviously trended together pre-COVID. What happens in COVID is asking rents go up, but the government introduces a moratorium on evictions and, and rent freezes, right? So realized rents don't move. So hence, shelter CPI also doesn't move with a lag, but asking rents are up. Then obviously by 21, the rent moratoriums are over. So slowly realize rents need to start catching up because the, the new rents being contracted has to be at the asking rates, right? Because all the eviction moratorium is over. So the red line catches up. Now the, the black line starts to catch up slowly, but with this like on average, you know, maybe up to 18 months lag by the time they survey people. But whilst this is catching up, rent keeps going up because obviously, you know, the economy is great, you know, the late, you know, housing market's tight. So there's this big gap here and it hasn't closed. And this is what's propping up shelter CPI. This is what puts the Fed in a difficult position. The underlying conditions are deflationary, but the headline numbers look bad. So again, if the Fed needs to go early, they need to kind of, they will need to explain this to everyone and tell, explain to everyone why this is okay. And they've tried, but obviously it's hard, right? We're all gonna just see the Bloomberg consensus expectation and, and react to it. So you can see in terms of order of magnitude, this is potentially up to 10 points worth, right? If, if obviously rent only goes sideways, then you know, that's a good, <laughs> You know, that, that's quite a lot annualized to catch up, right? Obviously, you could end up with, if you truly have a really hard recession, then the rents can come off, and that's one way to converge. But regardless, you can see, and by the way, rent's like 25% of the CPI basket, right? And for core, it's even bigger. So this is like a big uh, constraint on the Fed. Um, so, and similarly, you know, previous things we flagged was uh, a lot of the data you see has seasonal adjustments in it, because if it didn't, it would just look crazy. Right, it would just look like noise. So you have to have seasonal adjustments. But COVID distorted seasonal patterns because obviously pre-COVID, for example, for the labor market, right, there's, in the summer, there's an increase in temp jobs and holiday jobs, but a lot of the uh, jobs related to teaching go away, just like you know, heading into Christmas, right, there's an the initial ramp in kind of temp workers into Christmas and then those jobs go away. So there's huge seasonality in the data. COVID basically broke that method. So before COVID, the way it was done was everyone did like a trading five-year pattern, took that as the, as the gospel truth, and then applied that seasonal factor forward. So obviously, this broke in COVID, and this is why we've had very distorted uh, labor market data as well. So if you make the adjustment for these seasonal factors, you get a much clearer picture of labor market deterioration in the US. And uh, basically, last month, well, actually this month even is the the BLS finally started making the correcting for these adjustments. So this is why there was like a big hoopla about uh, initial jobless claims, right? Obviously, you know, this is, these are things we are aware of. Um, and then obviously, you know, a lot people who were bullish beforehand dismissed it as a technical adjustment. Obviously people like us who were bearish already are just like, ah, oh, see, I told you, right? But the underlying picture is still, there is deterioration in the labor market. And there's a lot of these COVID factors uh, that is just making the data look artificially weird. Uh, but the underlying picture is actually a, a lot clearer. Um, so overall, I would say on fixed income, these are the factors that are limiting. So net-net, we like owning fixed income to play for recession cyclically, even though we think structurally, you know, it, it, it's going to reset to much higher um, equilibrium rate. So it's, it's kind of, a, you know, it's kind of a, a, you know, something you rent, right? It's a position you rent, you're not going to own, own it for a long time. Um, but yeah, that's how frame it. Uh, yeah, so again, there's obviously tons of debate on, on, on the US dollar right now about kind of de-dollarization and, you know, all, all these other factors. Um, I mean, I, I would say I'm a skeptic, but the problem is there's not that much data to back it either way. 
Um, but what I would say is I'm going to present some data we do track that I think give a, a, actually a much better explanation for why the dollar is doing what it's doing, both the rally last year and the sell-off this year. So the bottom left chart is a, so ultimately FX is one of the hardest things to predict in terms of using a, to, it's, it, trading models actually work okay on FX, but if you want to do like six to 12 months out, it's probably one of the hardest things to predict because the, the fact is driving it a lot of the times are not significant enough. It's only every few years you get major FX flows due to major policy divergence or major kind of macro events. That's when it moves, right? So the classic example is like dollar yen Abinomics trade. It's like a straight flow story that supports it. Um, so what's happened in the dollar is basically commodity financing needs being one of the most important factors driving it. So you had the red line going up, the dollar rally. And by the way, the red line is again pushed forward 12 months. So it's a prediction of where things are going. So this is one of the big factors for the dollar uh, last year and this year. So ultimately, commodity demand is inelastic. So if you don't have the dollars, but you need to buy you know, oil, you're going you're gonna to sell enough of your local currency to buy it. And this was basically the story of 22, because there was a huge need, uh, there was a huge deficit globally in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the need for the rest of the world to, to, to buy dollars to finance. Um, to finance their uh, commodity purchase. And obviously, right now, this is completely reversed. The second offsetting factor is the kind of more traditional dollar smile concept, popularized by Stephen Jen back when he was at Morgan Stanley, and now obviously runs his own hedge fund uh, research shop, right? So that, that idea is that the dollar tends to do well either in a uh, US recession or when the US outperforms. Uh, but if there's no recession and the rest of the world outperforms, the dollar's weaker. And the intuition is that money will flow into the US either as a safe haven when it's a US recession, or it'll flow into the US when the US is the best place to invest. The rest of the time, the money flows out. Right? That, that's kind of the intuition. And empirically, it's true. And we can show it here using our LEIs right, for the three quadrants. The problem is that the rationale for this historically has been you know, when the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches the code. Typically, the US is led in terms of the sequencing. So it's more normally the US goes into recession first which reduces global demand, which then causes everybody else to go into recession. And then everybody else goes into recession, so they send their money into the US. This is obviously being flipped this time around because China and Europe had their recession last year. US was obviously fine last year. Now this year is when the US goes into recession. China's already out, and Europe's somewhat caught up in between. So you know, that would be one factor that suggests that the safe haven flows, the usual dollar should have a massive you know, dollar wrecking ball, all these things, right? You know, people are going to pile back into, um, into dollar. It might not work as it has historically because the underlying sequencing is out. So these are factors that actually suggest that it's probably too hard to make an outright call on the dollar for now, but the bias would be at some point when the recession is obvious to go short the dollar. And obviously, Druckenmiller came out yesterday, right? And obviously, you know, p people pay attention when he talks uh, for the trade, but I think, you know, at least on our models, we're not quite there, but the bias would be, again, once the US recession is obvious, I think then the dollar short becomes a lot more obvious when these things become aligned. There's another kind of big structural factor that, um, that's very complicated for the dollar right now. So in theory, because basically FX hedging costs have gone up a lot because typically uh, users, uh, the final users typically hedge FX using FX forwards. So that's implied um, kind of cross-currency basis and, and um, uh, embedded into the forward price. And so what's been happening is basically the cost of FX hedging from dollars into local currency has been crazy expensive. So that if you actually did everything on like for like basis, the US dollar basically has the lowest yield in the world, even though the headline is very high. Right? So for all the major consumers of US basically debt, right? so the Koreans, the Taiwanese, and obviously the Japanese, you know, and obviously we show euro and stuff here. It's been crazy expensive to hedge into dollars. This, in theory, should be dollar bearish because these guys should stop buying U.S. treasuries. But in practice, this basically hasn't happened. And you can track this in every auction because um, the indirect bid of uh, share of every auction is basically a proxy what foreigners are doing in the auction. And broadly speaking, foreigners across the entire maturity spectrum are started uh, buying more of it. So we just show it versus 12 months moving average. So basically, foreigners are still uh, basically buying the dip and, and sticking to their bids, even though it's, it would be uh, impractical if they were to hedge. So, imp so what is actually happening is they're just choosing not to hedge, right? They're just taking it outright. I pick up my 4% yield because you know, my local yields are like 1% or 2%, and we just take, you know, we can live with FX risk.
Um, or in fact, what we'll do is we come to the US, we'll buy some agency debt, we'll buy some IG, right? That's a lot more yield to play with. So there's a bunch of these things that are giving you a mixed picture on the dollar right now. So we probably want to see it clear up a little bit. If these two align, then the weaker dollar story makes sense. Uh, this narrative that people are going to start avoiding the US de-dollarization is probably very slow moving uh, because ultimately, in practical terms, the biggest, by far largest market in the world is the US Treasury market, right? In terms of order magnitude, it's just, there's, there's nothing comparable. So if anyone needs to move any um, sizable amount of money, it's going to have to be uh, in, in the Treasury market. So I think that's the kind of understated thing. Like, I don't think anyone at individual level will be like, I'm going to, you know, my, I'm going to go into a liquid market and just bid up gold, right? This, is like, this was the kind of whole gold bug thing, which is, like, hey, if people just put, you know, 1% of, you know, that, if all the central banks just put 0.5% into gold, it should be, you know, go to like 10,000, right? And a lot of these things. But actually, in practice, I think at the margin when they come to make the decision, liquidity matters, so it tends to be slower, a slower moving process. So that's why I think it's kind of a non-story, non but at least we can track it like this. The big story is, you get the reverse of the commodity input financing, uh, but ideally we want the recession to hit, to be more obvious first before uh, it becomes a dollar bearish trade. Oh. And yeah, finally on commodities, um, so again, we're in that transition period now that the China recession model switched off, some of these forecast models are starting to go up. We haven't quite come out from the, the bearish regime, but we're getting there. The demand supply model, you know, broadly speaking, because obviously the leading indicators are quite recessionary. Uh, overall, I think you know, we're still quite concerned about demand destruction, uh, but the supply side is very tight. So it's kind of this thing where as soon as the cycle bottoms, we'll, we'll want to go max, kind of mass risk uh, long commodities again. But we're just almost there and not quite. And the reason to be doubly cautious this time around in terms of commodity demand destruction is there's a non-linear relationship between inflation and, oil, and basically demand, right? In this case, I've shown oil consumption. Essentially, massive spikes in inflation have been demand destructive. So, so a normal range of inflation doesn't really impact uh, the oil consumption. But when inflation is very high, going towards double digits, that actually tends to have too big an impact on disposable incomes and also on, um, on kind of uh, consumer sentiment, right? And there's various research done on this, you know. Um, you know, the, 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 vo the volatility of um, inflation actually tends to be predictive for future uh, consumption preferences as well. Um, so that, uh, that it begins with a K, there's a, there's, a, there's a name for it, but it's not ketosis, but it's not, okay, I've, I've just lost, but yeah. It begins with a K, there's like a whole economic theory behind it. But anyway, so that's why there's some concerns where, because we're working off from this period of a big gap up in inflation, and because of these recessionary dynamics, US-China divergence, it still feels like the demand destruction is still there. Arguably, this is why oil and these things being weak, right? Copper and these things, they've not had the rally you would expect because the underlying demand picture is still weak. But structurally, this is ultimately still going to be a great area to invest in. You know, we've written three major kind of big deep dives into commodity markets. And in particular, into the lessons of commodity history, where the normal pushbacks on the investment are one, technology is going to displace it. This, is, this will be the Cathy Wood school of, you know, oil's going away, right? And the other kind of big pushback is regulations are going to kill it. They're going to tax, you know, tax all your guys. You're not going to make any money. Well, those things are empirically false uh, based on our reading of history. So that we could find no instance historically of a commodity market getting regulated out of existence before the economics turn. The closest you get is one, CFCs was outlawed by the Montreal um, uh, pro protocol, um, where that, that, you know, it's one of the, these conventions where basically it was like everyone in the UN signed it, everyone agreed to outlaw CFCs, right? And they were like, okay, this is bad for the environment, ozone layer, so forth. What you don't see is that DuPont was the one who backed this because DuPont had the next generation of, uh, of, uh, of chemicals, essentially, that they were going to sell, and they had themselves phased this out. So they were the ones behind it, right? There's just tons of these examples where, um, you know, by the time regulation came in for coal, by the time regulation came in for all these kind of sin, you know, prohibition, right? There's lots of analogies where actually it's never stuck. As long as the underlying economics makes sense, it just keeps going. 
So then this means you, if the regulation is ultimately a non-issue, and what you want to focus on is the technology. Is technology going to destroy the economics? And so this comes back to basically how low are you in the base load of kind of energy efficiency, right? So this is this comes back a little. I don't know how many of you follow like Doomberg. He's very good on writing about this kind of kind of things, right? So, um, but basically, the, the, heart, the idea is that technological disruption can take many many forms. So even in something like whale oil, what you don't see is that after whale oil stops being used for lighting, it gets used for a bunch of other stuff. Right, and like the in, and actually because the supply side of the industry shrink, prices hold up. So that if you were an investor, prices can actually hold up for a while. Right, you know, very obvious disruption stuff like rubber. Rubber used to be only grown naturally. Right, um, you know, it used to be uh, obviously uh, in the Amazon, in Brazil, in Indonesia. Um, well, actually, the, the stories I do, you know, the British went and stole seeds, right, and planted in Kew Gardens, and then you know they they took it. They took it to yeah, Southeast Asia. But essentially, that was one, again, uh, during the war, the pressure meant that um, there was a need. We were running out of rubber. So basically, they came up with synthetic rubber. right? So in theory, if you come up with synthetic rubber, is there still a market for natural rubber? And the answer, it turns out, is yes. Today, the market share is half-half. So half the market is still natural rubber. They're still kind of chopping stuff down you know, in, in Amazon or, or whatever. right? And the half of it is... Um, natural rubber, something like fur, right? We've had synthetic fur for a while. In theory, why would you need to, you know, why is there still a market for fur? But it turns out the Chinese buy tons of fur, right? They, they just want real fur. They don't want synthetic fur. So even for fur, like, there's still a huge market. So for all these commodities, it's not very clear how the technology go, goes. And, and the main lesson is that it takes a long time for these things to go away. And typically, alternative uses are found. And that's for the marginal commodities. For something that's core, which is linked to energy, the number one criteria is efficiency. Right? And we just, it just turns out there's nothing more efficient we found than you know, organic matter you know, made very, very dense over millions of years and burning it. It's just like the physics of it is so compelling for coal and oil that if we, if, unless there's a concerted attempt to really, everyone globally accepts a much lower living standard, right? There's some real um, breakthrough in like nuclear fusion, these kind of, right? You need something major. Otherwise, in terms of the, the demand for energy needed, it, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna uh, go away that easily. So, yeah, so the, so the main lesson is technological disruption we should keep, our, we obviously wanna keep an eye on, but broadly speaking, it doesn't change. It's very hard to fight the underlying physics. Regulation actually doesn't really, um, matter, even though there's lots of examples where artificially it looks like it does. And so that's why ultimately we're somewhat comfortable with our kind of whole upstream quantity, energy, copper, industrial metals, um, kind, of, kind of thesis structurally. Um, so now we're just waiting for the cycle, cyclical piece to turn, and, um, and then yeah, it'll be good for our commodities again. And I think that's it. Uh, so yeah, I think we would leave it there, and uh, we can do some Q&A if needed. If I could ask the first question, if possible. Um, how does the phenomenon of passive investing, which obviously is very non-uniform in some markets, it's very far advanced, in others it's non-existent, but it's clearly uh, an investing approach where it's flows-driven, it's mechanical, it's not based on fundamental analysis. Does this alter the framework in any way? Some people... Like Mike Green suggests that ultimately, as more and more assets are invested passively, it's very inflationary to uh, devaluations, um, and it makes the market structure very fragile because as long as flows go one way, everything's perfect. But if they were to turn, the active players are extinct and dead, and there's nobody to buy. Is this perhaps one of these regime shifts uh, type issues, but on a much broader scale than, let's say, a, a recessionary regime shift? Um, so with a lot of these um, very complicated questions, I think we probably want to go back to first principles a little bit. But I, I will say, so something we probably use a lot in our, when we were trying to like, write reports and stuff, is there's like a Dr. Seuss quote. Sometimes you know, the questions are complicated, but sometimes the answers are simple. So from a first principle point of view, right? You, the, the question is actually, is it truly passive or not? Right. This is the same as basically all quantitative trading systematic systems. Is it truly systematic? You always let it run, or do you have the option to turn the switch off? So I think that's my main question on it. I think that's going to drive, um, drive how you 
think about it, right? So if it's truly guaranteed, you know, <laughs> passive, you know, like, you know, you have a physical key, like for your Bitcoin, you throw it away, kind of, right? And it's truly passive, then, then I think that phenomenon just means you remove certain parts of the, you remove the active, that, that pool of assets from the market, right? But in theory, all the passive guys should not be having an impact on the price, right? Because the, the, the marginal, it should be the marginal bid or seller that determines price. So once we get in, everyone's done with passive, then the marginal buyer-seller is surely the active guys that are left, right? And, but if the passive guys are truly passive and they never interact again, then it doesn't matter how big or small the pa active guys are, they are the marginal buyers. So in which case there should still be price discovery and these guys just eat the loss or the gains when they go with it. The problem, and this is first principles, right? But the problem obviously is it's probably not genuinely passive, right? It's all passive because you know, 2020 ended up being a non-event. None of us have sat, you know, the past, you know, obviously I can speak for my generation, right, millennial, whatever. Like, we probably haven't been used to the idea that, you know, our robo-ETF, you know, advisor, sat, we haven't, you know, woke up to like a 70% loss, right, in, in a major drawdown from our passive strategy. If we did, would that change it? And I think that was where I think is, my question is always like, I don't think it's truly, truly passive because someone ultimately made that decision to allocate in. And so if something bad happens, they might take it out. So, so, and obviously in that case, then everything he says would be true, right? Then it's just, instead of the marginal bidder, it's just the marginal seller the whole way down. But in theory, in principle, if all the passive, in the steady state, it's about the marginal buyer seller, so there should still be price discovery. It shouldn't actually make a difference. And, and obviously in theory, if there's less, but that also, by the way, gives you the counterintuitive conclusion. It doesn't matter how many active or passive managers there are. The pool of assets doesn't matter, right? In that, if, the, if there's a trillion dollars or a billion dollars in passive, as long as they're truly passive, they'll move, then it doesn't matter, right? It's still the active guys who make the marginal decision. So those are like at least how I've thought about the problem. But obviously, I don't have the answer for whether the passive guys are going to sell or not. But that would be how I kind of frame the, the problem. Thank you. You, you could have given me a warning even asked that, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Put me on the spot, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, if you're using quite a data-intensive approach, you know, you were saying earlier, macro seems to be a sort of 69, 70 scenario. Um, Index-linked bonds didn't exist in the 70s. Bitcoin didn't exist in the 70s. You know, when you think about that macro scenario and how assets that didn't exist at the time might react now, how do you set about that piece of work or do you just not look at those things? I think Bitcoin is kind of in its own bucket, right? Because, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be very hard. I, I, I couldn't give you a... I don't think I have a very good answer because there's in the data, so it would just be my opinion, right? But obviously, um, ultimately, I think in terms of DeFi and a lot of the areas, I think the problem is people think of crypto is obviously just Bitcoin and Ethereum and you know, all the bad actors, but there's obviously a lot of technological innovation that's gone on in the space. So I probably have a more agnostic view that ultimately there's probably a chance for, for it to play a digital, digital goal kind of role in the steady state, but it's gonna take a long time to get there. Uh, so at least for this upcoming cycle, I feel like it's, it's gonna act more like it has, right? Which is basically just a liquidity play. Um, for, for the most part. Um, but in, like inflation in bonds, I think that's a bit more, like if you have a, if you have a view on, on inflation and you know, in theory that it's actually linked to the index, right? So, so presumably that's easier to see. So, well, I think most break-evens are what pricing in less than 300 basis points right now, right? So you're still gonna be getting value no matter where. So yeah, that, that'll probably actually do quite well. But, but, but by the way, if you're interested, the only data series you can find of inflation expectations going back that far is that there's like a quarterly Philly Fed series that can actually go back that far. So that's like the only one if you wanted an actual proxy for inflation expectations in the, in the, in the U.S. data anyway. Yeah. Cheers. Mm. Cheers. So... I'm probably one of the least uh, advanced people in the financial industry in this room, but I'm more on the technological side. And um, I wanted to ask you a question about what you think of uh, artificial intelligence, especially in the last six months, the advancements that uh, this has brought, 
and what it's going to mean for the labor force, especially in the US, or for uh, all those jobs that are probably going to be replaced. So if you could expand a little bit on, <laughs> on this. I think this is a complicated question without a simple, without a simple answer. Um, so I will say it's, it's um, I, I would say it's a very powerful tool that we've adopted a lot already. So, for example, using something like ChatGPT, etc., to help write code, it just saves you so much time, right? Like, it's, what it spits out is not always usable. It will hallucinate functions, but like the time save is unbelievable. Um, equally, to summarize things that you know well, then if you know, if basically, I think if you know what answer you need, but not quite sure, then yeah, then I think it's very good, but. Obviously, if you don't know the answer you need, you're back to the traditional problem, right? Like, it's not new. There's been tons of AI machine learning funds for a while, right? And in general, these funds of performance have not been great. Because at heart, I think there's, um, there's a concept of what will happen and playing the game. And you have to be very differentiated in, how, in, in putting specification on that rather than just let everything be general and be black box, right? So I know you can do support vector machine and look at the Shapley values and stuff, but it's, it's, these things are shifting all the time. You, you, don't, you lose that structure that needs to probably reflect a little bit um, what will happen versus playing the game and then break the two apart. I think that's, that's the important piece that it might be quite hard to specify. But I mean, other things I've noticed with applying machine learning strategies is the classic, if the inputs are bad, the output is bad, right? And most of the time what I've seen is people, you know, you basically just plug into Refinitiv, output 60,000 series and start training, right? And obviously in terms of Ch chat GBT, these LLM, uh, models, right, to so just plug into the internet and like, you know, billions of um, data points and train. So th because that wasn't necessary to filter on, on data quality, this is probably why, you know, ChatGPT is great if I want to find out some movie uh, quotes, right, because that's always stable, you know, that's fine. But if I ask it an uh, investment question, if it was accidentally trained on all the kind of, you know, fraud, you know, all those LinkedIn, Twitter DMs you get on, hey, buy this, then obviously it's going to be wrong, right? It's like, hey, buy this next crypto NFT. If, it, if, it, if that dominated the training set, then obviously that becomes problematic. So I, I, I would view it as it's like, a, at this stage anyway, on, on what we can, right? So we're talking specifically L LNM, you know, random forest, all these things we can, that's already being adopted, that you, we have a good sense of. I would say it's a very useful tool, right? Obviously, you know, if we ever get to more general intelligence and stuff, then yeah, obviously that, that will be a displacement. So as far as I can tell right now, it does speed up workflows a lot for finding information, um, in terms of starting points. So to the extent that a lot of white collar jobs are not really thinking, but gathering data. So I would say, if I had to estimate, my job is probably a third of it is just me trying to find data or like checking data. So if AI speeds that up, then that's gone, right? So then obviously for the labor force, then maybe that's a third of the white collar labor force technically doesn't need. Um, a friend of mine that works at a very big financial institution and their whole team, in fact, whole division has, uh, has been given like a corporate license in ChatGPT and they're all using it a lot. Just, you know, just simple stuff like, uh, get, get, me a, get me like the inflation series for, I don't know, Egypt, right? Or something like, there's just various like use cases like that. And so his estimate is he thinks two thirds of the staff on the floor will be, don't need to be there in 10 years. Because so much of the job is getting data cleaning. But in terms of the, the output, by definition what these models are, right? They're basically designed to hallucinate actually, right? It's a feature, not a bug, right? That's the whole point of, and that model. So I think there's an element of, you know, it will, it will, with a good probability, it'll give you a lot of good answers and there'll be some things that are bad, right? This, at least that's my understanding of it. So yeah, we, I mean, we start adopting, yeah, but mainly just to help write code. But again, this is where it's not really new, right? Because for example, if you look at like um, autopilot, right? And like GitHub and stuff, these are much better, right? Like the code they suggest to you speeds up your workflow so much more than actually the ChatGPT one. But for example, but if I need to transition my language or something new, then you know, ChatGPT is not a bad starting point. So I, that, that's probably where it's at. It's definitely very useful. And if you don't use it, you're gonna fall behind. But it doesn't feel like the, uh, the, 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 the kind of game-breaking thing is being made out yet, right? Based on the use case I can see, um, yeah. I have um, just a follow-up question. So you mentioned that about 35%, like a third of your job is data cleaning and stuff like that. Um, and that other people's, uh, other people's jobs might be replaced. So if you think about like maybe like a third of the, of the workforce in the US 
uh, is going to be laid off because of AI. What what impact would have ha would this have on markets and uh, and your model? Does does your model take it into account, for example? Well, this is the model model that we work on, right? So there's, these are things we'll probably be aware of, but. Again, this is not technically new, right? Like the closest historical analog would be industrial revolution, the Luddites going around smashing the spinning jennies and stuff, right? So in the long run, the, the experience is that in theory that the labor force can reskill and adapt. But obviously the missing piece of history is that for the, that generation caught up, it's going to be like 20 years of just like really, really bad economic outcome, right? So obviously this is where this also may ties into a lot of themes, right? So universal basic income, the government stepping in, government trying to create these jobs. So ultimately, that probably seems the, the natural outcome if it proceeds at pace, obviously. But if it's slower, right? So, th so this is the thing, right? You, we, if we can agree on the end state, you don't know how we're going to get there, right? So you're assuming the third is like tomorrow and then everyone's fired on the street. We've got massive unemployment, you know, Great Depression style uh, kind of setup. Right? What if it just, it's a very, very slow, Kind of thing, right? I mean, arguably, in finance, there's probably tons of people who mainly still work on a desktop in Excel, right? Even the hospitals, people use fax machines, right? So, like, these are the the the, the transition of technology is not uh, instant, and there's a transition phase, right? So, I, I suspect it's probably more like that, where you hit replacement cost, but then due to adjustments and stuff, it takes a while if it was to happen. So, I think that's probably the part where the transition <coughs> might be smoother. Um, yeah. So, so, so we'll. Yeah, we'll see, right? That, but you know, that's that's probably where my mind went first, and the second one would be maybe Karl Marx will ultimately be proven right, right? His whole point is maybe nobody else needs to work; the machines will do everything, and it's a utopia, right? That'd be the other thing in terms of yeah, capital and labor. So, uh, but yeah, I think the, the the pace will matter a lot, and just just looking. Uh, generally how technology dissipates, right? Obviously, you know, there's tons of studies in the S-curve, right? Early adopter, late adopter. These things actually probably don't happen that quickly, actually. So, yeah, it might not be as disruptive uh, you know, in, in, on a short time scale, actually. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised uh, or, or, or I'm struck by the fact that you include very little political uh, uh, factors into your analysis, into your models. So, uh, uh, or is it implied in, in, in the models? How, how do you take into account war and elections in the US, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, so, well, one is obviously that's more like a, a value judgment kind of thing because like, it's hard to get consistent data, but there are things we have done. So, for example, in war, there's things we have, right? So, for example, when the Ukraine war happened, we wrote a report talking about the analogies to uh, the Korea war, to uh, Operation Desert Storm, right? Where you, so, there are things you can do where the market behavior and the kind of rough factors around it match, and, um, and you can draw kind of broader takeaways. So, Basically, for the tw for major 20th century wars where it was associated with the market crash, the bottom basically came after major U.S. intervention. So this can go all the way back to Pearl Harbor. So obviously Pearl Harbor happens, markets sell off. Uh, the turning point was the Battle of Midway because Midway was after that was the U.S. was going to win. That was the wipeout of the Japanese Navy, right? Um, for when uh, when Saddam invaded Kuwait, again it was like it was like. Markets tanked, there was worried about oil, and then it was literally US boots on the ground, Operation Ellison on the ground, entered the market bottom. Uh, Korea War, again, the North obviously started invading, got all the way to Seoul, and then the UN uh, drafted a resolution. I think it was like McDouglas, or, or like. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, so then obviously MacArthur lands, right? He gets appointed by the UN, and then that's, that's the bottom, right? So the Korea War lasts another three years, but the market's bottom after he lands. So empirically, the market's generally bottom once the US boots landed on the ground. That's what makes this war basically, like, seems like it's going to go on forever, right? Because typically it's taking the superpower, putting boots on the ground as an unequivocal commitment from the US that they're going to do something about it. So there are these things you can tease out uh, a little bit, but yeah, otherwise it's, it's clearly quite hard. But you know, there are kind of uh, uh, you know empirical things you can you know. There's actually tons of <coughs> experts in those fields who have quantified it, right? So the the polit U.S. political cycle, uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but it's very famous. It's got a model. It's like a checklist as well. It just goes through and it predicts. It's predicted every single election whether the incumbent wins or a new guy wins, right? It's got trigger thresholds. Does anyone know the name? Yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. 
Yeah, he's famous every four years, right? You hear his name every four years. And, um, but, but anyway, he's got to check this. It's just stuff like, stuff like is it incumbent or not? You know, is, is GDP up or down, right? And, and stuff like that. So he's got a simple checklist. And then he can do this all the way back to the 1800s. And he predicts every single election, including Trump, including Trump losing. Right, so, you know, so no, 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 it's not. It's, it's like an academic. He's, it's like a professor of history and stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so there are frameworks you can do to actually make it a bit more actionable. But beyond those big ones though, right? Like in terms of say, a lot of short-term events, they've generally been non-events over the course, right? You know, North Korea missile test or like even 9-11, right? All these had ended up having short-lived kind of temporary impacts. So um, I, I mean, obviously it's gonna be increasingly important to track politics, but I feel like that's probably where in terms of man plus machine, you, you need to probably reserve uh, reserve judgment, but those are some examples of, of things we've we've looked at. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, you didn't mention debt. Um, now in OECD uh, country, debt is way above the ninety percent uh, GDP uh, threshold where it starts to be um, uh, counterproductive. And uh, um, so um, how is it going to be? Uh, uh, is it going to be inflated away? Or is it going to be, uh, uh, you mentioned also the infrastructure gap. How are, are they going to finance um, spending, further spending on, on, on infrastructure? I mean, how do you see the debt uh, uh, le level going forward? Do you think that it will continue to increase or decrease because of uh, inflation? What is your uh, likely scenario on that? Um, so, so what well, I'm probably more aligned with kind of the Michael Pettis view on debt fragility. So at heart, he's essentially saying, it's actually unknowable the critical point at which it becomes the system is too fragile, right? Because obviously you say debt to GDP, but debt to GDP in Japan has obviously gotten a lot higher. Debt to GDP in China has gotten a lot higher. So in terms of the acute risk, that's kind of, I'm gonna default to the indicators. But structurally, there's a very good historical analog, right? So the one I'm using for that would be kind of uh, the Treasury Fed Accord, which is 1942 to 1951. Okay, so basically, this is the gov This is basically financial repression, which is the government generates inflation, keep interest rates low, and then inflate away the value of the debt slowly over time. Right. So obviously, GDP is in nominal terms, so the real value goes down. So the reason 42 to 51 is such a good analogy for today was, again, the the rationale for justifying these policies can be similar. Right. So back then, it was the U.S. Uh, the need to win World War II justify why they did your curve control effectively. Back then it was your curve caps. So it was basically like a moral duty for the US to try and win World War II. Therefore the government was gonna spend unlimited amounts of money and it was the Fed's moral duty to help the government finance it, which meant the Fed would buy unlimited amounts of all government debt at um, whatever, I think it was like two, yeah. And, yeah, well, that was, yeah, there was a short-term and a long-term yield, right? They agreed to cap two points. And so obviously what ended up happening was the government spent a bunch of money, the Fed backstopped it, the Fed balance sheet uh, became a function of what the government was doing. Um, and then when the war was over, they lifted all the uh, rationing mechanisms, so you got a wave of inflation and you got more of inflation. So you become very volatile but high inflation, so that helped to reduce the real <coughs> value of debt. But they kept it going for a while, right? So it was only... If nine, so the, the, so they kept this going for nine years to try and get the real value of debt down. And eventually when they needed to restore credibility, they signed the Fed Treasury Accord. And that's where all the Fed's kind of modern day kind of um, institutional high structure comes from, right? Because they signed the accord that the, the Fed's gonna be independent, they're gonna have inflation mandate, and that's how they reestablish credibility, right? So th and this is kind of what Japan is, is trying, right? So the reason, so at least my reading of Japan would be, the, we know the BOJ basically own, owns all the JGBs, right, in terms of there's, there's no real secondary market. And then, um, you know, they have obviously yield curve control in place. Now the inflation is high, they need to find a way to slowly inflate uh, their debt away. So that's basically like the good solution, right? This is, so in Pettis' scenario, he talks about this as a good solution, and he talks about a bad solution to that. The bad solution is, is um, 
deflationary, right? It was basically like austerity, the government cut spending, you know, we have to balance the budget, right? And this is a li little bit linked to kind of, uh, you know, if you heard of Keynes talks about uh, the paradox of thrift, right? There are a lot of these concepts that are linked, which is if the gov ultimately, um, you should think about it as a regime shift or not, right? So the regime shift is whether the government is credible or not. If the government is credible, it doesn't matter what the government does because you should think of the private sector balance sheet as independent of the public balance sheet, right? And so that's why fiscal deficits help activity because when the government runs a fiscal deficit, the private sector balance sheet starts looking better and then the private sector balance sheet starts levering up. But as long as that levering up leads to productive activity investment, it will more than pay for itself, right? Now the scenario you're talking about, the concern is we have that shift where the government isn't credible, right? And if it isn't credible, the framework we use is basically Bernholz's framework on hyperinflation, right? So, this, so Professor Bernholz, well he used to be in Switzerland, I think he's, he's dead now, but um, so his whole framework was that he studied every single historical hyperinflation episodes and he came up with two metrics you can track for when government credibility is lost and can't come back. The first is that your revenue to spending gap hits 40%. So effectively, um, you need to spend 100 to support all your fiscal spending, but you only have 60 of revenues coming in. So once you hit that gap historically, no government's ever been able to come back in a normal way. And the second piece of that is the central bank monetizes the debt. So a central bank balance sheet increases to cover the gap, i.e. printing money to cover it. So those have been historically the two um, that has um, been the point of no return at which there will be no credibility for government. So we've never gotten close on both measures, even though independent measures we have, so in, in terms of the, uh, the, the current setup. So that would be kind of, I guess, how I would think about it in the starting point. Like, is the deficit so big or not? Like, those are the measures he found as important. The actual debt to GDP number, there's no magic threshold um, at which it, it, um, it, suddenly you have a crisis, right? And that's a little bit petty at this point. And actually, if you dig into data, because it, you can think of it maybe as a, maybe in that proximal versus fundamental concept, it's like a fundamental risk that maybe it's there, but it's, it's not, it doesn't seem that actionable basically, the, the series. But what you find is actionable is actually, um, typically what you're really worried about with inflation is actually velocity in money going higher, right? But the velocity in money empirically lags uh, basically the shape of the yield curve. So actually, so if you, so as long as you get the bad kind of bear steepening where term premium goes up, yield curve steepen, that's actually a warning that velocity in money might pick up in a bad way, and then that will lead to kind of more inflationary risk. So that's kind of I, I would say is the a more real time measure of the risk, right? But if you ask me what's going to happen, I, it's you know it'll, it'll just be try to slowly deflate the debt away, run inflation at four or five percent, keep rates at two or three percent, and then you know, hope, hope that but works. How long it will take then uh, if we have this kind of uh, difference? Uh, it's hard to know, yeah. It could take ages. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. But it's, it's, it's unknowable unless, because it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a common knowledge game, right? Like, if, if, if we all agree that we're gonna uh, accept what the government's doing, it'll be fine, right? And, and this is why if it's a common knowledge game, people all sorts of things, right? Right now it could just be that it's, your, it's our moral duty that for, to, for our children's generation, we have to solve the climate crisis now, that we should be willing to spend as much money as needed today. And it's the moral duty of central banks to, gov to back it, and anyone who steps up is basically against children, right? And then so we can just start spending, but then because of the common knowledge game, we all agree that debt to GDP will go up, but it's fine because this is necessary and it's important to do. And then eventually when there's a time, so we can all do this, and as long as the common knowledge game holds, eventually when we do decide to reset, you, we can do another Fair Treasury Accord, right? Or historically it'll be like the debt jubilees, right? That, that you know, historically, I think it's, it's like uh, in Judaism, right, they have, right? So, so ultimately, as long as the common knowledge game holds, you just, you just carry on. Ultimately, money is an artificial construct, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's what we agree on what it is. So your scenario you're worried about is when the, the common knowledge game breaks, when it's hyperinflationary, right? You're worried about, I guess, you know, the Germany, the right, you know, the right smart hyperinflation, those scenarios. But in those cases, you need very extreme readings on the government deficits before people kind of lose confidence, right? At least. We're getting there now. Uh, the, the Biden administration is precisely asking the right to spend unlimited amount of monies out of the. Yeah. 
But, but then the, the, the Fed will need to buy up, though. So right now... Exactly. So that's, that's precisely the scenario you're describing, isn't it? But the magnitude is not that, right? Well, he'll need to spend it first, and we'll see if the magnitude gets there. <laughs> right. And, and we know also that uh, uh, when you have a period of war, inflation is always, uh, yeah. always there and cannot be controlled. Yeah, so I, I think obviously we've seen it. So, you know, I, from, well, put it like this, right? People have been worried about this for, obviously this has been an ongoing concern since the GFC, right? So why has it not, so why, so is it more like this hasn't blown up in the past 13 years? since the GFC? Is the reason it hasn't blown up that it's coming, or is it because there's something wrong with the thesis? Right, and I think the common knowledge aspect is, is quite important, right? At least the, the way, the way I, I think about it. But either way, so the way I think about it is if, in terms of if it's actionable or not, what you should do is, clearly we're into an inflation environment anyway, so you're gonna own real assets anyway, right? You're gonna be owning gold and stuff. So you can, you're gonna have this part of your portfolio in case that those things happen, but I wouldn't be, I just think it's not as, um, but, so the reason this works is a little bit like investing in insurance companies or investing in financial companies, right? There's a lot of times where the, you can take the, the profit up front and the losses are hidden in the book and to be realized over many years and we don't know, right? This is why investing in banks, especially investment banks, derivative books, is so hard. There's an element of this with when governments spend money because the promised, right, like, there's all this, there's a lot of things that's supposed to happen that's in the accounting wise determine how you discount, it's, it's murky, but they can get like an instant benefit now and people want instant benefit, right? I think that's why it's quite hard that yes, eventually if you do enough bad things, like there's enough bad things hidden in the system, right? The insurance company will blow up, right? But there'll be a catalyst that makes it blow up. But in the intervening time, it can go for a while, right? Japan's like a really interesting example where, you know, it just kept going and going um, and and it's because the common knowledge game says, says you know, they don't want to blow it up. They don't want to open the, they're not going to open the, open the lid and find out, right? It's a demographic dimension to Japan. Population is decreasing, and it's decreasing faster and faster. Yeah, but, but why is it infl but, but I think there's a misunderstanding. Because you, there's, there's plenty of uh, studies on whether demographics inflation or deflationary, right? There's actually a lot of stuff on both sides. Empirically, what we found is, it's not a one for one solution because it's again incomplete. The way demographics should work, in our view, is you should think of people using the capital cycle. So there are people who consume savings, there are people who provide savings. So basically, young people and old people consume savings, and the middle age provide savings. And so that's actually the flow of demographics over time that drives the market clearing rate for real interest rates. And obviously real interest rates, you add on inflation to give you the nominal piece. So we're actually going to a world where the, save, the, the demographic savers in the world are going way down relative to the consumers of savings. I.e. the amount of old people and young people relative to middle age is actually going globally going like that if you GDP weight it. If you don't, then obviously, you know, you know, if you include like Africa and stuff, it's not like that. But the key point is demographics on its own doesn't matter for the things we care about, which is inflation or rates, unless you account for the economic weight. So if you GDP weight and then track that ratio, empirically that actually gives you a very good relationship to where yields are done. Because that ratio essentially from the 60s up to the nine, uh, up to like the 80s go up, which is when yields went up. From the 80s to 2010 went down, which is why there's a big downtrend, and now it's gone way back up. And it's, and it's projected to keep going up for the next 10 years. So that suggests we're in a period where yields are secularly gonna go higher because of this savings mismatch. And that to me is more intuitive because you capture both the demand and supply side and the interaction of the two and how they shake out. And, and inherently that doesn't say anything about inflation. That tells you about what the clearing rate for savings are. In, in, in that general discussion, what are your views on uh, essentially the potential decoupling between the West and the BRICS countries and uh, potentially also the impact of adoption of CBDC uh, uh, as how, could it be a, a breaking um, game of, of all the analysis and, and how, how so you, things move forward? And to kind of, you mean central bank digital currency yes. when you say yes. yeah. Um, you know, I think the central bank digital currency is like a great way for governments to control what's going on, right? To know what's going on, track illicit activity or all these things. So it seems more like a tool uh, for them, but why? But presumably that'll be accounted for, right? Why would that break unless they don't add it to accounting? So it's, it's like, it, well, I mean, the, the banking system is already digital, right? These are all ones and zeros on machines anyway. 
So the, the real drive to adopt it, in my mind, I think at least for governments that want to know what's going on, is it allows them to have an un, uh, unbreakable trace right, of, of everything. And that's probably the real appeal. At least that's my understanding. Uh, I thought the issue is more that everybody has a deposit at the central bank and the commercial mm -hmm. banking system. Oh, is that the concern? I see. It's dependent on the central bank to get, to get money <coughs> to fund lending. Uh, well, isn't it, that's kind of what we have today anyway, isn't it? Why is it that? Indirectly, hey? Indirectly you have a decoupling between the central bank and, and uh, uh, the central bank and currency and the retail currency. Uh, and there are two levels where currency is being created and consumed and uh, moving and removing the intermediaries of, of the banking, the commercial I see. banking uh, can create a certain uh, decoupling. Then you were talking also about degrowth potentially. I see. The price of energy and other things. Is that a concern that we, we can modelize somehow? Uh, well, I think for thing out credit creation, if we track both, it's still okay, right? Because the whole point is like the definition of liquidity captures both central banks and commercial banks together. So if there's a shift, then presumably you can still count the two as long as it's money being created from thin air. Mm -hmm. So that part doesn't seem to be broken. But yeah, in terms of the ability to lend credit, clearly where that money goes will be very different, right? Mm -hmm. um, but arguably in a system like China's, China, for example, it's already heavily government driven anyway, right? It's basically local governments sell land and issue local government bonds to you know, do what they need to do. And so they're the ones who get credit. So that's probably not that big a shift. So it's probably more gonna be impact here um, if central banks start. And obviously we've seen hints of this, right? It, it, even during COVID in terms of who qualifies. So yeah, I think, yeah, that's true actually. So I guess the implication is there will be a more, more amount of investment more issues with um, credit allocation. That's obviously, again, ultimately is, is, is uh, going to be more inflationary to the extent governments. The only politicization of credit, if you see where yeah. Yeah. the only place commercial banks can get funding is from the central bank because they can't attract deposits. I see, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know how quickly it will be adopted, but yeah, that, 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 that's definitely fair enough. Um, yeah, I haven't actually thought that hard about it, actually. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming.